You who? North Carolina A&T uh, was the number one U.S. university uh, in the auto drive challenge. Of course, uh, Toronto uh, beat everybody, but I'm very impressed. This was a um, Chevy Bolt with the B given to each school to develop autonomous driving. So each school came up with um, their own software and sensor suite and things like that. Wow. And they, they scored 522 points, which is, uh, you know, for a small agricultural and technology school uh, that we visited before, uh, that's very impressive. I mean, they beat Texas A&M, Michigan Tech. You know, those are some big Virginia Tech, Michigan State. Those are big schools. Yeah, this is uh, the school where the North Carolina State uh, sponsor, Dr. Corey, for uh, NCFLL uh, teaches. So we've been over to NCANT for um, first Lego League um, kickoff and uh, regional championships. So Don and I have both gotten caught with an internal combustion engine car, him with the GMC and me with my van of getting out while it wasn't in park and it's starting to roll um yeah and uh that certainly is something that's happened i mean in the last couple of years i got out of my gmc and, uh and uh luckily i got was able to jump into it before it hit a tree <laughs> oh god <laughs> um anyway uh uh, bills have been introduced into the u.s congress according to this report from autoline detroit this is uh, Friday's or Thursday or Friday's report, uh, auto line daily, um, to make the auto park uh, feature uh, mandatory on cars so that if you exit the car, uh, it will automatically put itself in park. Of course, is exactly what the Tesla does. And there are several times Ruby has done that. I thought, I guess, probably in my case, she thought she was in, I thought she was in park because I had her in hold. Yeah. And when you go to get out and it's in hold, it shifts it into park or, you know, put moves it to park. Well, they said 145 people have been killed between 2012 and 2014. The most uh, uh, news one had been the Star Trek actor, actor. Yeah. was killed by his car because it wasn't in park and he got out of it and it rolled backwards and, and pinned him and killed him. Uh, so that's, this is serious stuff. So good for this. And then the other part of this is that according to this report four people have been uh, died this year uh, due to keyless ignition uh, cars uh, left running in the owner's garage these people didn't were trying to commit suicide they basically got out of their car for whatever reason and left the car running in their garage and then the car continued to run and then the carbon monoxide got into the house and basically uh, kill the, 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 the homeowners. Uh, so they're going to uh, legislate that um, these newer cars, uh, after uh, idling for a couple minutes, they're gonna have to turn off automatically. We've had a nice casual Saturday morning and uh, we're headed to historic Oakview uh, Park in Raleigh. It's not too far from us as you can see up 401 get on the belt line for a few and uh this uh park and historic site uh talks all about the history of cotton so in contrast to yesterday's history of tobacco today we bring you cotton so the panera bread has finally opened i think it opened friday we're just out for a casual saturday drive but there's uh more traffic than we expected here on Main Street. So yesterday, Don and I put a lot of numbers in the video. Yeah. And frankly, we were so wore out from our little tour of the homestead and the amount of time it took us to pull the numbers that we never really gave any opinions, viewpoint, impressions, uh, you know, no emotional stuff about the car in the uh, anniversary review. So. I asked Don to write down three things he loves about the car and three things he would like to improve about Ruby. 
and I did the same thing and we have not shared with each other what those right. are <laughs> so while we drive over here to the park I thought we would go ahead and uh, and capture that and I'm gonna let Don lead off with uh, the things that he loves about Ruby right well the number one thing uh, anybody who's been watching our videos for a while knows we both commented on I think that the uh, self-presenting doors uh, is my favorite feature of Ruby. That's my favorite thing about Ruby is still the self-presenting doors. I cannot believe that the simple chore of opening and closing the door, the driver's door, or opening and closing passenger doors, or popping the trunk, uh, all those, all those, that stuff is just to die for. That's my favorite feature. Okay, you can keep going. Oh, you want? Okay. Yeah, I want you to do all, all three. Right. Yeah, yeah, well, my second one is, um, you know, more common to all electric cars. I like the instant torque, the fast acceleration. You know that, no, the one pedal driving, all of the things that come along with having an electric car, uh, I like that, you know, uh, again, I'm, I'm thinking of other electric cars have that same feeling, but I you know call it the EV grin and Ruby definitely gives that and the last thing is uh, you know it's one of those things that you don't think about because every day goes in day in day out week in week out and that's not going to gas stations because we charge at home honestly leaving home every morning with our case about 230 235 miles of usable range that day is a real a real luxury and I I think that that is something that people don't know whenever you're running late for an appointment you never have to worry about stopping and getting gas or uh, that just doesn't happen I don't miss going into gas station obviously with my GMC and my XB I still do from time to time but you know with Ruby the only time we visit a gas station is to supercharge it like sheets and that's it <laughs> well, mine and Don's are pretty similar, and I guess that is not too surprising. Our number one and our number two are just flip-flopped. So I put speed, but I'm not going to just say all EVs. I'm just going to say Tesla speed, even though I understand that there's that instant torque. But it's really, I love the Tesla speed. I never knew how much I was going to enjoy it. Now, I am not a speed down the road kind of a girl, but I could drag race you off of every stoplight and be pretty happy so uh yeah and i when i'm merging in traffic i feel safer you know michelle's with me she's like i just leave them you know <laughs> or just you know even michelle gets into the act with the speed thing but you know if i accidentally turning off of that road close to our house in the morning and somebody's coming over that curve over there which can be a little dangerous i just give Ruby a little more acceleration and trust me it's not a problem to leave you know to be safe and leave those people behind so the speed didn't think about it but the speed and then number two is the doors the self-presenting door I don't um, walk away and let it close too much behind me anymore but it opening up every time I come to get in the car made even better when Don has moved the car out of the garage for me and the door swings all the way open because I've got my purse and my water and my vlogging camera and my phone and all these things in my hands that girls and moms and I know some guys too have and I'm just really grateful about the door opening for me and also hitting the brake pedal and the door closing and I wonder with Don it's like well, why is Tesla not doing this on other cars and why uh, you know four feet obviously and why haven't other manufacturers picked up on how great that is and you know overall door control on the X where I can when I had Michelle's family with me this week open and close the door for people from the center console and make sure everybody's safe in the, in the car and I like that door control and multifaceted door control but I really like that and then the third thing I love is I love the updates the software updates um, the car is continually getting better all the time and there are both functional um, improvements and fun improvements and I I admit to liking both of those whether we're introducing a new Atari game or we've got the new um, 
you know, feature coming out soon for the uh, enhanced summon or uh, stoplight traffic like recognition. You know, those are things for us in the in the third year of ownership that we're going to get to look forward to. So the car continues to get better over time, and um, it's exciting to be a Tesla owner for that that reason alone. All right. Now it's time for the things you would improve. Yeah, well now I need to, after listening to your top three positive things, I need to say, I, I could have came up with 10, but you said I could only do three. Well, what were a couple of the other ones you would have well, added? I, I, I would have said, you know, I do love traffic aware, cruise control, autopilot, the software updates, all that. Uh, and you know, uh, there's just a lot of things about the Tesla that I like. You know, I, I really like the white interior, the the vegan, the, the softness, the fact that it cleans up really easy. All, those little things this day in, day out, you know. Um, anyway, but there are a lot of things, but you ask for the top three. Now, the three things that uh, I comment on that aren't, uh, I don't want to call them negative, but I wish Tesla would do them. Uh, the the uh, top thing on the list for me, of course, I always again if you listen to me I want more regen I think it's just a little light on the regen uh, I mean I I think if they would just the model 3 sapphire driving her she had an adequate what I felt like I could if Ruby had as much regen as sapphire had I would be okay with it I'd actually like just to scooch more but I could certainly uh, uh, get along with uh, the mount that sapphire head is just it was a little bit more I don't know if it was 0.3 versus 0.25 G I don't remember but whatever it was it was noticeably more and I did like it uh, the second thing is a little strange It's probably never you would never guess but it, it happens because I tend to drive Ruby on trips I would actually like to have regular the option of having regular cruise control versus traffic aware I look like right now I'm in autopilot traffic where cruise control is doing all the acceleration and the braking that's great but when I'm going down the interstate I actually prefer especially before we got navigate on autopilot I would actually prefer the old-fashioned fixed cruise control where I would crawl up on the car and say well I'm getting a little close I'll turn my look in my mirror turn on my blinker and change lanes and without ever slowing up before we had navigate on autopilot, Ruby would always crawl up and she would slow down so perceptively. I would, you know, have the cruise control set for 75 and I'd look down at the cruise, uh, at the speedometer, I'd be doing 65. It's like, oh God almighty, I cannot tell you how many times that happened. Now navigate on autopilot with the auto lane change certainly mitigates that considerably, but still having the option of just giving me the old fixed cruise control uh, I, I could I could deal with that, especially when I'm uh, just driving the car, uh, which I still believe not. I actually do enjoy driving the car. Autopilot, you know, is great, but I still enjoy driving. And uh, uh, the third thing uh, is uh, one of those trivial things, but it's something that, again, because Mary and I swap back and forth, I wish the bead pillar seat belt adjuster anchor point was. Um, controlled by the profile and it was motorized Amen. so it would go up and down uh, based on who's driving I really think that they need if they do any kind of interior refresh on the X they really need to put an actuator I mean this car has more actuators you can shake a stick at what's the harm of two more so go on or at least one more on the driver side maybe you don't do it on the passenger side but what's one more actuator uh, and then uh, Mary and I because all the time I'm adjusting it and she has to adjust it's just a constant back and forth every time we change drivers but uh, but really now you talk about gripes uh, the that's the, really my list uh, everything else um, I, I honestly I'm happy I mean the, the maintenance on it even the tire wear although it's a little higher than I would hope it's I'm okay with it it's a, it's a heavy car and like Marianne said we accelerate hard and that uses up tires so uh, honestly I'm thrilled with with the other with Riff Ruby so non threw in a few more uh, positives about the car I told him to go ahead and do that because it was so hard to limit it to three 
but I wanted y'all to know that I love traffic aware cruise control because when I have that sciatic pain down my right leg um, being able to not have my foot on the accelerator pedal and Ruby do all the braking and acceleration is a real lifesaver for me um, I'm using that almost all the time uh, not so much autopilot but definitely the traffic aware cruise control and for a person for whatever reason that has trouble keeping their right foot on the accelerator I find that to be invaluable I guess I kind of take it for granted now Don mentioned it because I just it so, works so flawlessly and I use it all the time that maybe I I forget about it sometimes. I love the Bluetooth hookup between my phone and the car. I know people want it to improve further. I'm okay with that. I mean, I hear you. Android, uh, auto player, the Apple stuff, whatever. But for me, you know, in the Honda Odyssey, I had this old kludgy little thing that hooked up the Bluetooth on my phone to the car and it was staticky and it was just horrible. And now I got my phone hooked up with all my stuff and then on top of that, I got all this free in-car streaming. People were fussing at Elon because they want Spotify instead of TuneIn and me, I'm still in the mode where all this free stuff is really great and thank you so much for giving me what you are giving me because Don's got his podcast and I have plenty of music to choose from that keeps me and all my passengers happy. So um, that's, you know, that's, that's a good thing. Um, so what would I improve? Well, I really had a heart. I had crappy stuff on my list. I had, I want you to fix the help so that everything in the profile has an eye next to it so I can get quick help right there. Let's be consistent. And also to add more uh, visuals to let people know that um, this is for both profiles or just the whole, all or, or uh, individual profiles because it's not, obvious on some of these things like that car honk thing the new lock detection that is across profiles well how would you know maybe i want the honk and don doesn't want the honk they didn't give us a choice there and also geolocation so i'm just going to lump that all in under let's work on the ui for the controls interface just a smidge more it's so much better than what it used to be despite me being a little upset when they first changed it because i couldn't find anything i really do think long term it was an improvement but let's make it so that some of these things we did it with um uh one of the new recent ones i'm trying to remember which one now um help me out donnie um Sentry mode, you can turn it off at home. Right. But this car honk thing, I you know, I don't want to honk in my own driveway in my neighborhood, so that one probably needs it. So a little bit more refinement between the help, the profiles, and the geo uh, fencing on these functions would be good as an overall continued profile improvement. Um, I want a kick plate on the back. I mean, I love it that I can open the trunk from the screen and I can or my key fob and I can close it from the little button or my key fob or the screen but when I come at it with my hands are full and I don't want to I never look at my I don't my I forget I have a key fob it's in my purse I don't use it okay so when I come up to the car and I want the trunk open and I'm by myself and my hands are full I just want to be able to wave my foot underneath the bottom of the trunk or tap a little kick plate there and have the trunk open for me that would just ease my entry into the car when I'm out shopping which we do all the time in Ruby just a little bit more um, I think that would be cool and that ties also into I'm gonna lump it together with um, let's figure out how we can close the frunk on all the Tesla's or open it well I guess it opens uh, but doesn't go up without changing out the struts and you I want it to close from the screen I want it you know that more automated too so let's a little more automation for the trunk and the frunk and I would be even a more happy Tesla driver and I really think this next one is gonna happen eventually it just hasn't happened yet I want an additional enhancement to navigation where it can, you know, I want them to continue to work on it so it continues to work more like it does on my phone. I want it to throw up three possible routes and let me pick which one. Um, like I said, when I go over to Jordan Lake or whatever, and I want it to let me add waypoints. I don't want to use uh, a better route planner. I mean, I demoed it the other day and it's cool and it does what it says it does and it does it, you know, well. 
but I just want, I don't want to need a third party thing for that. I just want the navigation in the car to do it. And we're already, you know, cause I've been in these other cars now, I feel like the size of the screen and Tesla's navigation is already leaps and bounds above what else I've seen personally. Maybe there's somebody out there that's, but I'm not from, I'm, Tesla's the best as far as I can tell. But that doesn't mean even if you're the best that you can't um, continue to improve it a little bit more. So let's continue to work on navigation. You know, the navigation route to get places is just so optional. <laughs> um, but I always approve when Don uh, decides to go a different route, just like I do sometimes in the car. Today he's giving me the opportunity to uh, get an update on this building that's under construction that none of us has seen for a few weeks now since I haven't been going into downtown Raleigh twice a day. And it uh, definitely looks like it continues to come along. The main parks that away, but with a very small parking lot, so we parked down here. They were here to check on something. We weren't sure if they were running a drill or if there was actually a problem, but it must have not have been too serious if it was a problem. Yeah, it's really good Pokemon going here. This might be a good place to come for community day. I mean, look at all of those stops and the gyms. Oh my. These are Muscadine grapes. And the lady at Duke Homestead yesterday was very clear to tell us that they did not make wine out of them on the Duke Homestead. It was for jam. Good Methodist was not drinking wine. Although I have to tell you, in modern day times, the Muscadine grapes are all about that wine. Here are some goats. It says, I guess sometimes you're allowed to feed them. They have a lot of school tours come here, and you know kids love seeing the critters. I love seeing the critters. Dedicated June 6, 1996, in memory of John W. McQuaid have to look him up at home. See there's a little bit of a wildflower garden over there. They have obviously a bluebird trail. I see bluebird box. They have to be at least a hundred feet apart. The bluebirds nestings they don't want to be too close to each other. It really is sad that it is a real problem that there are some kids that when they're not in school they don't get lunch. So uh Nice to see that this is one of the places you can come for a meal if you need Although it. Although you cannot actually go inside the big house, I do not believe there are quite a few outbuildings that you can go into. And they have uh, some historical literature in them. There are no animals in the barn right now, but it's daytime of course, so it looks like they bring the goats in at night. <laughs> this guy's name is Walt. Levi and Elliot, Felix and Leroy. So I'm glad they're all feeling well enough to be outside today. It is uh, warmer today than yesterday out in the sun, but still quite the nice day today. The poor guys down there at the visitor center are refinishing the floor and have stirred up dust and that's what set off the fire alarm. This is the kitchen garden, according to Dawn, so they would have grown things that were edible here. And I do see quite a few herbs and medicinal type plants. Unfortunately, I don't see any butterflies. You know, I'm loving the park, but that's I-40 or 540 over there. And um, yeah, I could do without all the noise during our scenic tour, it's pretty loud. So this is the cotton gin house. So the sign said that the cotton ginning took place on the second floor and then the cotton was dropped down through a chute back to the first floor. Is that it right there? 60 saw gin. Yeah, basically what you would call a saw blade, a circular saw blade. Uh huh. It's a stack of saw blades. And the saws would. Oh, really? Yeah. They're all along in a row. 
and as they spin, they grab the uh, fiber of the cotton, they pull it off. Then another, this thing over here, turns the opposite direction and rakes. You can see the brush in there. Rakes the lint off of the saw blades. And so what basically happens is after all the lint comes off the cotton seed kernel, uh -huh. is it'll fall through. It, in other words, the, the saw blades are spaced yet far apart. And so then they fall through because they don't, they don't care anything about the seed, they want the lint. And the lint is you know, what, they're, what they're after. But yeah, it's the most ripped off invention of all, all time. So this gen has 60 blades. It's from the 1870s. Um, yeah, this gets back to... They were either powered by steam or gasoline engines. Yeah, that's, this one was... This looks more manual. This is a 50 saw gen. No, this So this is similar to one used here. This one dates to the 1850s. Um, is adequate for plantation gin. Uh, just local small processes, I guess. Right. This picture back here gives you an idea of it, of what it looked like while it was actually running. And I guess this is one of the bigger ones, but still, you get the gist. There was cotton flying everywhere, I think. Yeah, I think that's right. But you can't see. This is the interior in 1930 of this gin house. Illustration of Eli Whitney's circa 1793 gin design. It was mind boggling that it took until basically right around uh, 1801. I, it, it's quite, uh, 1793. That's what I, it took that long for the cotton gin to be invented. Up until then, cotton was still grown off the coast of South Carolina, but it's a special cotton that didn't have the seed in the it. The hard seed hull? That's right. And it, very little of it. It was very particular. This, once they came out with the cotton gin, then just cotton that we've had that had the seed could be grown anywhere. And it would make way more cotton. Um, Here's a bale of uh, what the bale of the cotton looks like. You know when the kids come in here on the school tour groups, they love this. <laughs> wow. I think the barn cat liked to be up there on top taking him a nap. Just half I had to say. So this scale over here, it says could weigh bales up to 700 pounds. So I don't know how much that one behind us weighs, but I'm sure several hundred at least because it's pretty big. There's a lot of cotton there and it's very compacted. You know when you donate a bag of clothes to the thrift store, how heavy the bag gets? Well, just imagine and that's all compacted. So Don says this is the seeds and it has some benefits, but it wasn't what the people that wanted the cotton wanted. Yeah, the textile people have no need for that. So they were selling- Fertilizer and animal feed, it yeah. says. Right. Okay. And cotton seed oil, uh, food, pro I mean, um, they found out a lot of uses. This for was an anti-bow weevil device. It had uh, molasses and arsenic, and then it would try to coat the plant some so that the weevil couldn't damage it as much. It's called a mopper, thus the little, mopping looking uh, fabric there on the end of it. Yeah, Enterprise Alabama, which is right about here, they actually have a statue to the boll weevil because the boll weevil came through there and wiped out cotton and um, wiped, out, wiped, off, wiped out the cotton production. It caused them to start growing peanuts. And George Washington Carver, of course, um, in Tuskegee Institute, they came up with lots of uses for the peanut. And the peanuts what saved the economy of South, South Alabama after the um, Well, we've all killed the cotton. When I was a little kid, I lived in Loxley, Alabama, and there were 
gobs of peanut farmers still there. Um, and potato too, but lots of lots of peanut farms. Well, it says in um, the 70s we began an eradication program in North Carolina, and as of 1987, we are declared a boll weevil free state. I don't even want to know the amount of pesticides involved in making that happen. We'll just pretend we don't know. But that's why organic cotton shirts are so expensive. It makes you wonder how they make organic cotton if the bow weevil is that prevalent of an insect. Probably relies on all the other farms around the organic farm uh, making sure they're eradicated. I don't know. Here's what we were looking for. We understand they don't want the kids to hurt their fingers, but we really wanted to see from the inside what it looked like. <coughs> I see they must give a small demonstration with this machine when the school groups come through. Yeah, you can see the spine teeth on the saw blade. They pass through these slots that keeps the uh, lint and the seeds on one side. The tiny little teeth grab the lint and pull it through uh, the slots. Then the brush picks, cleans, cleans the saw the, blade. off the saw blade. And then of course they, they take the lint and they bail it up. There, you can see how serrated the saw blades are. Now I told the historian yesterday at Duke Homestead that the writing on these walls was important and they actually she said as far as she knew they had not studied the writing on the walls at Duke Homestead um, I know they spent a lot of time studying the writing on the walls at Yates Mill and that is why I know to look for this see most people just probably think it's um, dirt on the wall or graffiti sometimes it can be hard to read but but these is probably from the early 1900s people that came through and used the cotton gin workers family members it's pretty fascinating history just to go around and study the writing The sign says they use the uh, black ink to mark the weights on the cotton bales and that the marks on the walls were made with this ink. It doesn't talk about the fact that, you know, while you were here, you wanted to, you know, just like on a tree, carve your name, you would use the ink. I'm sure at Yates Mill, they had a lot of access to the ink because they were marking weights and such on the, uh, the corn that was milled there. Going to market on the wagon. Wow, I'm surprised the horse and the wagon could handle all that weight. And this is an 80 saw gin over here. Now, I know you always tell the horror stories about how your uncle down in Alabama had you picking watermelons. That's right. And it was a hard, hot, uh, right. horrible work, but at least you got to break the watermelons out in the field take a chunk of the center and leave them you know you could just get the best part and keep going yeah i never knew there were seeds in watermelon because we only ate the heart <laughs> right so does that mean you ever had anything to do with cotton not really my uncle uh, planted five acres of cotton every year to get the cotton subsidy he didn't do anything with the cotton but he planted his five acres filled out the paperwork and got a check from the government and then plowed it under well yeah pretty much but yeah we didn't pick it we didn't do anything we just planted the cotton okay and uh, the reason for that is that was to keep the price stable uh, if everybody grew cotton and actually took it to market uh, it would drive the price of cotton down to the point where people couldn't make a living at it. So they basically had programs in the 50s and the 60s, I don't know when it ended, that you could uh, just plant a little cotton and, and uh, as long as you kept that, that, they would basically maximize your supplement to that. So the smaller you amount you planted, the more money you get from the government for doing it. So uh, if you planted a thousand acres, you didn't get very much. Huh. So what else besides watermelons? Oh, we did peas and butter beans. Peas uh, and butter beans. Peas and butter beans, and of course we had peaches. Uh, Freestone? Uh, uh, both, uh, uh, but um, uh, plums. Um, but the, the, the crops that we planted every year was peas and butter beans, uh, and we planted the five acres of cotton. We didn't do much with horse, uh, corn or anything like that. 
Uh, but uh, yeah, my uncle, uh, he was a, a truck, what they call, he worked full time uh, uh, in Birmingham and in Montgomery, uh, depending on, you know, what era we're talking about. And uh, he farmed just on the side, you know, and uh, took the stuff, we'd bring it into Prattville and stuff and sell it on weekends at the farmer's market. And uh, thus maybe some of the reason why Don doesn't want to dig in the dirt. Yeah, I, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, there's, there's, uh, dirt equates to work. There's nothing that comes out of that ground that doesn't involve work. It's clean. Wow, so they had to cut down and get rid of the stalks to get rid of the bow weevil. This is the Williams family cemetery dating back to uh, 1799, I guess. Buried in 1870, so late 1800s. So yesterday at Duke Homestead, we heard about the Plank Kitchen, and uh, here's the Blank Kitchen at Historic Oak View. I guess we're on the back side of the plantation house near the water tower. It's pretty back here. So let's go inside the plank house. I mean the plank kitchen. Well, you see where they made the fire to cook, wash the clothes, canned the vegetables, made the butter. And uh, what are they doing over here? This is uh, what it looked like in uh, 1990 before it was restored. Oh, wow. It was overgrown with a lot of greenery. That was after, I guess, they got some of the greenery off, but uh, we're not done with the restoration. And, and this, again, this that was the before. Oldest structure on the property. Wow. It's just after four. Maybe we can take a peek. All we can do is say we're closed. I don't think when I was here before we were able to go inside. Wow, I love it when they have these old pictures. Napoleon Bonaparte Williams, 1836 to 18. 85. John Quincy Williams, 1831 to 1866. It's cool in here. They've added air conditioning and electricity. I'm sure they have some events here. Wow, this is great. I'm glad we got to step inside. Oh, wow, it's pretty down here. This is obviously a modern addition. Here's where we're missing our personalized tour guide. Mm -hmm. Right? Yep. So this might have been the library, because obviously it has the shelves with the books on it. Yeah. This looks like the men's parlor. Yeah. And modern edition, sure, but how modern's modern? Like the 1920s or something? 1940s? Yeah, like that. Yeah. yeah, I mean, modern, but not that modern. We'll have to see if we can find out online a little bit more about the inside of the house. I like that book. I book. know, I love that built in bookcase. And the cantilever. Yeah, cantilever window. Mm -hmm. So they do plan to add furniture. And we'll probably be back in October 5th from 10 to 4 p.m. for Heritage Day. Absolutely gorgeous beech tree. B-E-E-C-H. And you can see, yeah, the front of the house now. that the farmhouse was once a smaller home. This building has been on this site since 1855 when Benton S.D. Williams built Oak View in 1855 as an I-frame Greek revival style farmhouse. A style popular at the time. The do most dominant feature of the Greek revival is the double portico column front 
of the home which remains unchanged to this day it's very pretty it uh, is it's definitely. beautiful i like the dental molding up the top and the um railing That's yeah very it's neat. very nice it says when the pool family bought this property in the 40s 1940 they decided to significantly remodel and update the house while every care was taken to respect the antebellum heritage of the structure they created an entirely new and modern home the remodel followed many of the trends of the 30s and 40s including adding a colonial revival element a blend of the old and the new so I guess that's when that library was added was probably in the 40s. In the 40s. Well, that's what I said. It's modern, but it's 1920 or 1940, yep. right? Yep. Yep. Greek Revival and Colonial Revival. So that window is new as well, I guess. Oh, yeah. wow. Look at how pretty in the 40s when it was snowed one day. Yeah. So now you can yeah, see. Yeah, see people in the south, when it actually snows, that would be worth getting out your camera yep. to take a picture of yep. your home. <laughs> yeah. Editions, this is before it was renovated so you can see it's just the main house structure and not the walkway and not the library room so the storage room all that den and the where the cantilever window was the bay window uh, and the porch and the porch were all added in the 40 1941 approximately huh so when they bought it, it was a tiny little thing because that was all that's there. funny that on the ground floor it had that hole in the back where they added the storage area see there and then here that's mm -hmm. funny that it, it wasn't a complete rectangle to me yep now how many chimneys in this house it's just happened to be looking up there well i saw baseboard heat so it may have um yeah but it was built in 1855 there had to be fireplaces yeah i saw radiators but yeah that's right Steam. I don't know when steam. Maybe there's steam. one down on that far end over there. I'm just surprised. You know, my grandmother's 200-year-old house up in New Jersey, she, there was uh, two, three fireplaces in it. I mean, you know, you got to have fireplaces. At least this uh, end of the house has a fireplace, the end where they added the porch in the 40s. So it's got beautiful copper gutters and downspouts. you got to love it. Back in the, the good new old construction days. area, what I called the men's parlor, it has a fireplace, obviously, in between those two nice big library bookshelves. Weather vane. If there's another chimney up there, you know, I just can't this is see the it. carriage house. Uh, it was converted by the Poole family uh, to a two-car garage, and I guess in the 40s. Uh, or a little earlier it housed one 1920s vintage buick for the wyatt family so it's not no longer for horses well this is a very nice view here of the main house the carriage house and then what's this house over here donnie oh this is the pecan grove we'll, we'll find out what this house is in a minute I know the kids come over here and give the goats attention all the time, so I thought I'd come say hello. Hi. Yes, I can see why they have the metal netting on the side of the tree. How are you guys today? Hello. Hi. Yeah, unfortunately, they need a little more netting. The goats got all excited when they saw these people coming up the rail, the walkway here. I'm sure kids often bring treats. The sign basically says there were uh, always tenant farmers here and that there were somewhere between four to six tenant houses on the property, but by the mid 1980s, they had all been torn down. So they found this one in Wendell, which is not too far from here, and they moved it here to preserve it. I don't know, for a tenant house, this seems really nice. I right? Agree. I, I mean, I can get my widescreen, my Wi Fi, I'd be good. The refrigerator. <laughs> you have to have room for me and Johnny. Right. And. Be a good um, guy pad. Yeah, let's not think that way. 
Maybe lath it. and plaster. plaster. Yeah, this is the lath. L-A-T-H. Yeah, I think that's how you spell it. And it squeezes through there and that keeps it um, held keep to the wall. Held to the wall when it hardens. That's right. In the huh. plaster. Mm -hmm. The sign says that this picture up here was the house that stood at this location before it was uh, torn down in the east. Lots to mow out there underneath the pecan trees. Or is that pecan trees? Yeah, well. Which is it, Donnie? I can say pecan. Pecan, okay. I say, I don't know what I say anymore. I've been with you for so long. Again, Pumpkin, squash, watermelon, what's it say? Oh, water, oh this no. one on the end yeah. is watermelon. Yeah, zucchini. This is zucchini and this is okra. Oh boy, Donnie, okra. For a boy from Alabama, apparently he was exposed to more okra than he could stand in his youth and he doesn't like it. I like it and I'm from New Jersey. I didn't say anything about that vegetable. They grew that too. <laughs> Fishing is allowed here. For some, you got to follow some NC pole fishing rule or something, but you can fish along the banks of this waterway. Freshwater fishing rules apply. Okay. So we're on Jones Sausage Road over here on the southeast side of Raleigh, uh, we're just... approaching Garner. And uh, we're not sure what this building is, but Don says he thinks it might be Amazon. Yeah, we just literally, the Garner City Limits is like um, 200, 300 feet to our left here. Oh, there's a car coming. Um, so I think this is the... I think this is the new Amazon distribution center. Wow, it's huge. We'll read as we go past. See if we can see. You would think it would say future home of. Well, I remember uh, that they said something about Jones Sausage Road, but huh. yeah, but I, I think this is it. Yep, it's the old Conagra site, and it's supposed to bring 1,500 jobs to Garner. It's the new Amazon. They're building a whole, they bulldoze what was there, and they're putting a brand spanking new high-tech building. 